Um, should we go? I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I'm not going to look anywhere. <laughs> this, all this technology, I really like radio. I really like just the, vo the human voice and yeah. technology is inserting pictures into everything and cameras and I just try to ignore them. Um, so, you know, I, I want to start or I start with everybody. I start here with quantum physicists or theologians. Um, and I know that you have a really interesting answer to this question. I just want to hear a little bit about the religious and spiritual background that was there in your childhood. Well, both of my parents were very religious. My mother was a strict Catholic, and my father was a Southern Baptist. So they had very particular views. Um, my mother was a little more dogmatic. She really believed that Catholicism was the right way. Um, my father, even though he was a Southern Baptist, had he was a mystic. You know, he really looked for the mystical in religion and in all of life. So he just kind of channeled his mysticism into this, into Southern. Baptist religion because that's how he was brought up. He was he was kind of Pentecostal too, right? No, no, no. Where he did wasn't I, Pentecostal. I read that. No, no. Okay, because no. they are they. There's a mystical strain to that. Yeah, I think that he was. He may have gone to a church for a while, a Pentecostal mm -hmm. church, but you know he was always looking for where you connected to God. Yeah, you know, art, music, religion. Right. Some of those um, those Protestant. I mean, I grew up Southern Baptist in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. And there's a way in which I think a lot of people don't realize. I mean, the emphasis in some of those traditions on speaking to God directly, which mm -hmm. is such a departure from Catholicism, can mm -hmm. lend itself to a mysticism, even though sure. we think about mysticism as Catholic saints. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, my mother was very structured about that, you know, the rituals, the rules. It, was, it really made her feel safe. It was kind of perfect for her because mm -hmm. she was a very structured person. But um, neither one of those really worked for me. Right. It, it sounds like you were more raised, more Catholic. More Catholic. Mm -hmm. I went to Catholic school for 12 years. Um, it took me a long time to get rid of <laughs> some of the more pernicious uh, <laughs> aspects of that, you know. Yeah. Um, but my father had to sign a paper when he married my mom saying that he that the children could be raised Catholic. And then when we my parents split up and we visited my dad in summer, uh, my mother made him promise that he would take us mm -hmm. to Mass on Sundays. So he did. He was very dutiful about that. You know, I could I, I, I have to admire that now. He would sit in the back row and wait for us. And when I was about 15, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> And he said, but, you know, I promised you, I said, I won't tell her if you want. <laughs> and I could see it was a moral dilemma for him, but he let me stop. Right. And then the element, which I also think of as a spiritual element of your life, was music. Right? Mm, still is. There's this phrase um, in your memoir, li a life circumscribed by music. Mm. Um, so, you know, what was the shape of that? Growing up, how, how would that look like to have a life circumscribed by music? Well, I was really oppressed by what I thought spirituality was because I was only exposed to Catholicism, really, and then my dad's religion a bit later on. But um, it felt very constraining, and a lot of it had to do with feeling bad about myself. Mm -hmm. You know, the sin original sin, all of these concepts weighed really heavily on me. I took it seriously. You know, they had the veneer of authority, these people, and it just didn't, it sounded very scary what they were telling me. And it took me a long time to first start shedding the, the way I had felt, you know, restricted by it and the punitive aspects of it. And then it took me well into my 20s and early 30s to really find something that was mine and to realize that art and music 
was the kind of deity I was looking for, mm. that it was all there, the source of all creativity, light, enlightenment, beauty, revelation, inspiration, all of those things were in art and music. So I said, well, that's good enough for me. And so then the religion part of it would be, you know, finding that in myself, the authentic version of that. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you really experienced yourself to be a writer mm -hmm. before then you became a writer um, of, of music and a, and a musician yeah. as well. Yeah, I started writing. I mean, I loved language from the beginning. I was a kid who asked my mother to drop me at the library on Saturdays. It was very, it was really geeky. Mm -hmm. You know, I just would hole up with a book forever. If they had a, if they had a toy trade at school... I wanted Heidi, you know, the book. <laughs> um, but I didn't think I would become a musician because I thought that meant that you would have a public life and get famous, and I didn't want to do that. Well, you saw that, too. Yeah. I mean, my mother's version of things was that if you um, were a musician or performer, you were away from home all the time, and... You didn't have a private life, and you got on drugs, and you got divorced, and had affairs, and you know it didn't sound very appealing. Yeah, which she had, she experienced. She experienced that, right? all of that, right? And then, that was you know I true think for her. It's actually. so interesting when you 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 describe after graduating from high school, you joined your father's tour, mm -hmm. and you also had your own uh, close up experience of all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, you know, it was the 80s. I think everybody did drugs in the 80s. And, you know, it was, I was a musician. I was around a lot of musicians. But that lifestyle didn't appeal to me. Um, what appealed to me was the hard work to just show up for my job. And if art and music were the religion, then the hard work was the, you know, the dogma. <laughs> yeah. Or this or the sacrament or the ritual. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The sacrament. That's a better word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something else that really interested me, I think this is I think you wrote about this especially in your memoir. Um you, you talked about how your father you in that experience you really saw how your father was his best self on stage. Yes. And um and I've known performers also who are incredibly private, but then they kind of come alive on stage. Mm. But something you describe is it was like there were there were there were relational things that happened. Oh yeah, right. So it wasn't just this private right. being a performer, uh, and I think that's kind of counterintuitive and maybe also kind of special. I mean, well, he was a special performer and. He took all of his problems to the stage, to the spotlight, you know. It's, it was like being bathed in light in a literal sense. He really worked things out. He healed things. Mm -hmm. He asked June to marry him on stage, right. you know. Right. He felt his most natural self on stage, his largest self. And you also had experiences with him um, on stage, yeah. right? Yeah, I talked about this in my memoir that this, the last time he played Carnegie Hall and he wanted me to sing a song with him, I Still Miss Someone, which is one of, a, one of his greatest songs. And I was mad at him for some reason and I said, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a brat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I said no like a couple times. He asked me three or four times and I kept saying no. And then we were at the hotel about to go to Carnegie Hall, and he asked me once more. And I said no again. And then he turned away. He said, okay. And he turned away. And the look of his back struck me, like because I had seen that angle of his back from the wings so many times. And it filled me with so much love for him. It really moved me deeply because that's... You know, seeing my dad on stage was seeing my dad. It was really seeing mm. into his soul. So I said, wait, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And it it worked out like I hoped, you know? Like I didn't even know I hoped, but it worked out. I, I sang with him, and it, it all got fixed. <laughs> on stage. On stage. That still happens, you know? Sometimes 
I'm playing with my husband on stage and we've gotten in an, in an argument or something or, you know, we're tired, and cranky, and it will all get worked out in some solo he plays or mm -hmm. some note. That it's about the music then. Yeah. It's not about, about the... the Spotlights. And no, the it's audience. about the music. Yeah, it's definitely so about the, the music. Uh, so the music then kind of transcends even that setting. And is sure. that what you're saying? And the fact that they're, you know, when I first became a performer, I I was so anxious about it, and it took me a long time to grow into it because I thought that being a performer was about getting a lot of attention, and I didn't want that much attention. Right. I liked the writer's life. I liked the privacy and the solitude and being inside my own little mind cave. And over time, I realized that it's not about the attention, it's about the energy exchange. I'm doing something for them, but they're doing something for me too, mm. you know? And there's no hierarchy, really. Mm. It's, and some nights that exchange is so beautiful, you know? I, I can feel my own energy stretching out to the far reaches of the room, and there's coming back, and there's something sublime about it. And also the temporal nature of it, that at the end of the night, it's over. Right. It's like a monk's sand painting. It's wiped clean. Mm. And so you can't grab it, you know, which is part of the, the mystical beauty of it. You can't repeat it. You know, the next night might be just awful. Like right. your energy might not expand beyond two feet beyond you and they're not giving you anything and it doesn't work. But, you know, that's the way life is. Yeah. It's that spiritual discipline of knowing impermanence. Right? Knowing impermanence mm -hmm. and showing up even though you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised at times? I mean, because, you know, when I read your, when I read about you, you had a lot of reasons to resist going into that same profession yes. that you'd been surrounded with. And you you seem to always have been pretty aware of what you didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when somebody reads your biography, then suddenly in the 80s you start having hit songs. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, it's just, it's striking. Did you wake up sometimes and say, how did this happen? Sure. Uh, I still do. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, the, the trajectory of my career and my work, um, has been one of spirals. Like I had a lot of success in the beginning and not a lot of confidence or mastery in what I was doing. I was just kind of fumbling and that's not to say it wasn't good. You know, my instincts were still good, but there wasn't a lot of mastery. So then later on, I had a lot less success, but I developed more mastery. Mm -hmm. And I became comfortable with the idea of not, you know, not having as much success as I'd gotten used to in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It all became fine. It all kind of just focused into what my work was and the reverberations of that were really beyond my control, you know. And... There's a lot of love in that, you know. What do you mean by that? Well, my friend Stephen Pressfield, he wrote this great book called The War of Art, and he has this great line in it. He says, you have to show the muse you're serious. Mm. You know, you can't just expect to be hit by these beautiful bolts of inspiration and lightning. You have to keep showing up even if, you know... You don't get hit for a year or two years. Just show the muse you're serious. Hmm. And then that the relationship there feels like love to me. I mean, it feels like the heart opening. I think um I think my favorite song on the Black Cadillac album is um I Was Watching You. Yeah. Which really is about love. And time travel. Yeah. Well it's about love. Before life and beyond life. Yeah. That song was um, really um, odd in that it started with an image instead of a line. Usually when I'm writing, a phrase or a line or, you know, a couplet will come to me and that's where the song will start. 
this song, I was just sitting at the piano and I saw this Texas road with headlights on it. And so that was the first line of the song, headlights on a Texas road. And then it, it started developing. I didn't know where it was going. And then I saw three verses, one before life, one during life, one after mm. life. And that love was the constant, you know, and that w what survives of us is love. It's like that Philip Larkin poem, mm -hmm. what survives of us is love. So the song was kind of there. Sometimes I think songs are there in the ether <laughs> and you just have to have your skills good enough to get them. Right. You, you used a phrase somewhere, that uh, the same phrase that, uh, that Bobby McFerrin used with me, that, that you catch songs. Yeah. Which is a similar I was just going to say, you have your catcher's mitt on. <laughs> which is just fascinating to think about. Yeah, and sometimes I'm afraid that if I don't get it down, that somebody else will get it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, like, I don't want, you know, I don't want Lucinda to get this one. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, this I didn't expect to think about this, but something that I've talked about with scientists is um, there's this debate in science about whether, like, say, whether mathematics is invented or discovered. Do we come oh. up with it, or, or is it, you know, is it somewhere, is it somehow in the fabric of the universe and we're able to uh, turn it into an, an equation? And it, it seems to me that it's a similar idea it's to what you It's the same just thing. Said. And now you've stumbled on an area that I'm endlessly obsessed and fascinated with. Because fractals in nature, that perfection of math, that to me is, uh, is God. And that's the same thing as, as art, you know, that there's some creative force that organizes all of these things. And like you just said, we we glimpse it, we can just a little bit see it, you know, and understand it. And our math is like the fumblings of a, you know, a toddler mm. trying to talk about something that already exists that's so perfect and so complicated and full of so much mystery that we can barely touch it. And, you know, some of the people I, I trust the most who wrestle with this question of invented or discovered, well, what they'll say is it's it's both, right? Which well, is sure. way, a way of talking about creativity as well. Yeah, sure. Because if you don't have the skills to yeah. interpret it or mm -hmm. bring it into being or create it, you yeah. know, then it's it's law. It's somewhere else. It's lo it's still out there. Right. But it's I mean, lost. there's the image that you got. Yeah. The picture of a highway to Texas, yeah. and then you turn it into something, and right. so it's a it's both ends. Well, and then there's also that you know, the unknown element of genius. There are some people, some writers, some songwriters I admire that I consider genius and and that I'll never be, no matter how hard I worked, I wouldn't have the skills to catch those songs. You know <laughs> how you think of it? <laughs> yes. Right, and a physicist will say only an Einstein could write E yes. equals MC squared. Right, but I could... You know, I could work on my own skills enough to get the best songs I could possibly get. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing. That's my life. So so here's something else. And again, with the Black Cadillac that I've thought about. Um, actually, I have a daughter who's becoming a songwriter. Oh, it's so interesting her. to watch that. So the song, um, a really, really religious song, God is, God is in the Roses and the Thorns. Mm -hmm. So, you know... And this is often true of beautiful songs. If that were just a sentence on a page, you know, just it, a it line would be of trite. poetry, exactly. Yeah, it, it it's very, very, very simple. Um. So there's something that you do that's different when you when you turn words into mm -hmm. song, or that the music, the music transforms the mere words. Absolutely. Um, some of my songs wouldn't stand alone as poetry. Some would, I think. Mm -hmm. Some wouldn't because of the very thing you're talking about because they're so uh, bound to the melody or the backbeat, you know. 
that they can't be separated. Um, I'm about to do this project with a painter I know. He wants to use my lyrics and do paintings with them, like include them in the paintings. Mm -hmm. I was a little worried about that in the beginning, like, well, would the lyrics stand alone? Let me pick the lines. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, that's by nature the definition of songs is that the music is half of it, at least. So it means that when, I mean, so the difference is, say, when you were younger and you you wanted to be a pure writer. <clears throat> it would have been a different kind of writing. There's, there must be a whole different kind of instinct, intuition, that goes along with writing words that are going to become songs. I'm just fascinated. Yes. I'm just, yeah. yes, and the way I learned that is by listening to great songwriters. My dad is a truly great songwriter, and he, the way he uses Southern imagery and... Um, He's one of the greatest in that. And, you know, he's documented these things in time, like Big River. There's that kind of America doesn't exist anymore, where St. Louis to Memphis was an exotic trip, you mm -hmm. know. And his use of uh, onomatopoeia and alliteration, you know, in this really instinctive way, that's genius. So listening to those songs changed me, obviously, fundamentally. And listening to the Beatles, the, the precise song structure huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. And then as I got into my teens and 20s, I would write down lyrics that I admired just to see why they worked. Why is that so good? And I had this Bob Dylan book of um, his lyrics, and I read them over and over, and I would listen to the record and notice if he changed a pronoun or a the or an and, and that would mean so much to me. And it had great significance, so much so that when I look at these lyric sites online now and I see they've completely mangled my lyrics, it just, I can't <laughs> it bear it. It drives you crazy. It yeah. drives me crazy. I know what you mean. They have, they have the transcripts as well. It, yeah. Yeah, there's something about... If, if the way the lines are broken up is mm -hmm. important, whether it's an and or a but is important, mm -hmm. you know? And mistakes are yeah. really, really a big deal. So, I, so did you find this also when you were looking at... Bob Dylan lyrics that that it would be a just as a sentence on a page it would be trite but in a song it was well not him <laughs> <laughs> some people yes mm -hmm. generally not Bob mm -hmm. um but that you said now that God is in the roses was the most quote religious song well it is an it's an overtly yeah. religious song it's a God song yeah, except the imagery in it is not necessarily religious because, um, you know, the last verse about, the middle verse about the being in the cemetery, the sun is on the cemetery, leaves are on the stones, never was a place on earth that felt so much like home. Mm. That came because the the day after we buried my dad, I got up at five in the morning and waited for the Starbucks to open and got coffee and went and sat on his grave and watched the sunrise. Sun, yeah, the sunrise on his grave. And it was really comforting. I took two cups of coffee. It took his day for a long time. Yeah, no, for him. One oh, for him. you did? Really? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I felt so at peace watching the sunrise rise on his grave and then that gave me that verse but then I, I wanted to go out to you know more than just my personal experience um, saying I love you like a brother a father and a son and now when I sing that live I sing I love you all like brothers how did that happen I don't know because I feel a lot of uh, peace and Again, love when I sing that song and compassion for people who've lost people. Mm -hmm. We should sing God is in the Roses. I should sing it. Okay. John should play it, though, because I... Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Do you want to play it? Sure. John usually yeah. plays this. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how we'll do this, but... Just bring your chair you over. Are, or 
I could move. I could stand. Oh, no. Trust me, I'm so used to sitting on our living room floor. That's great. <laughs> oh, man, what the ball. <laughs> do you do yoga? I don't, but I'm flexible. I, I am athletic. Okay, like, I'm going to recommend that you should start now so you can maintain that. Yeah. So the reason I asked John to play it, I wrote the song on, um, you know, like, a, well, like I wrote it like a little, a folk song. And then when we recorded it, I actually, Bill Betrell produced this, you know, he transcended it into something else. Mm. And then John, when he plays it live, transcends it into something else too. Mm. Your web viewers are going to enjoy this yes, tuning will. moment. <laughs> <laughs> they will, actually. <laughs> All right. God is in the roses. The petals and the thorns The storms out on the oceans The souls who will be born And every drop of rain that falls falls on those who mourn God is in the roses and the thorns The sun is on the cemetery and leaves are on the stones there never was a place on earth that felt so much like home we're falling like the velvet petals we're bleeding and we're torn But God is in the roses and the thorns Love you all like brothers, a father and a son, and may not last forever, ever, but it never will be done. My whole world fits inside the moment I saw you be reborn But God is in the roses And that day was filled with roses God is in the roses and the thorns Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you, John. Oh, I'm so glad you did that. Well, we were talking a lot about it. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed appropriate.
I, I kind of know about writing, writing. I wonder if it's true of making an album. Um, I mean, the, the Black Cadillac album had a lot to do with this period of grieving and mourning and loss. Um, and also healing. It feels like there's healing in mm. there, too. And then you did this earlier album, Interiors, which mm-hmm. had to do with the unraveling of your first marriage. Is there a way in which uh, you work through things in the process of, of getting that that music out into the world? Is it? Well, yes, although I hesitate to say that because to just think of it as therapy or catharsis diminishes it to me because, you know, it's supposed to be a work of art and music Mm -hmm. and that's beyond therapy. I mean, just to say it's therapy is, you know, it's just narcissism then. But... um, but the bigger answer is yes, of course. And a lot of times I don't even know what's going on until I write about it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's even outside of linear time. And then it happens later on. And I say, oh, okay, that's what it's about. That's where, you know, what's happening. That's what's coming up. Um, Yeah, getting it on the written page, finding a melody to put to it, that organizes my life. It keeps me sane. Right. I I guess I guess I imagine that that you 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 put an end to a project like that. I mean, obviously the loss doesn't end, the mourning no. doesn't end, but you I I can imagine that you walk away from that project still different. You've You've walked through the experience with tools that everyone doesn't have to turn it into art. Well, I do remember when I was writing the songs for Black Cadillac, feeling really sorry for my sisters that they couldn't write songs Mm -hmm. because it gave me a lot of relief. It was just this, you know, intense pain. And to write a song let me know that there was still something alive in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And... God is in the roses um, was because in a moment of real mourning and loss, I still felt the presence of light. And I thought, wow, this it's a conundrum, you know, but it exists that mm. even in the darkest, darkest times, there's this overriding... Light is the only word I can think of to put to it. I mean, I guess some people would call that God, you know. Hmm. So I was pretty interested to see that you um, have this connection to Celtic music. Yeah, I love Celtic music. And it seems to me, uh, I remember talking to John O'Donohue. Did you know him? He was a Mm -hmm. great Irish poet. Uh, Talking to him about this, about how Celtic music, as much as any music I know, kind of conveys that, that it's all in there, right? There's pain and there's beauty and, and murder and murder and laughter, and, and, right? And, yeah. right? But it's all somehow contained yes. in the same songs. I also love Ali Bain and Phil Cunningham. Oh, yeah. I love them, too. Yeah. Um, so did, did that come later? Your father had, Johnny Cash had some roots in Fife. Well, I do too. I mean, right. we. But did um, you discover that? Did he always know that? No, he found out in the early '80s, and that the cash name came from Fife in Scotland, and uh, he. So he had the genealogy done, and then you know we traced it back to the 12th century. Hmm. That the name began there. Of course, you lose generations along there and people, but it seems that that's where it, it came from, and. Definitely in the in by medieval times, you know, the caches were well rooted there, and then the first cache left there in the 1600s and came to America. So my dad went there, and he just loved this connection. He loved Scotland so much, and he ended up doing this Christmas special there with Andy Williams as the guest oh, in <laughs> the 80s, and it was really cool. And so he gave me the genealogy, the book, and I went to Scotland, and John and I went. And uh, toured the palace and, you know, just kind of immersed ourselves in it. And then went and played with Celtic musicians right after that, actually, up in Aberdeen, which Mm -hmm. was fantastic. So I've been back a few times since then. And 
I just love it so much. I feel this, I mean, I could be creating all of this, but I really think that you ascribe meaning to what's important to, in your life, and that's how you create your life. Your life is shaped by what you ascribe meaning to, and I ascribe a lot of meaning to that particular place on earth. Mm-hmm. So John and I went last summer and played a benefit for the Falkland Trust, which, you know, is takes care of the grounds and the palace, and it's kind of this echo thing, too. They're doing organic oh, gardening really? there, too. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So we played this concert, just the two of us, and... You know, we had a few thousand people out in the lawn that day, and they were so welcoming, and I felt so much at home. By the last song, I was crying, you know, and then people in front of me started crying. (laughs) There was just this beautiful moment, like, you know, like the moment with my dad at Carnegie Hall, like where everything is felt, and it's out in the open, and nobody has their their guard up or their persona up. It's just all out in the open. Mm-hmm. And, I, and that's one of the best things that music does for me is it strips away the veneer. Well, and you, just coming back to this notion of your life being kind of drenched in music yeah, all your life. And I think Scotland is a place that's oh, drenched yeah. in music, right? It is. So I can imagine that kinship is more than just genetic. Well, sure. And then, the you know in the academic way that Celtic music became Appalachian music to Americans right. and then country music. So we have this, this straight line back mm-hmm. to that music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, me too. I mean, we're, we're talking about this, this entire time, but I, I, you know, I just, I, w- I would like to just ask you, how your sense of the meaning of making making music, the practice of music, you know, how 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 your sense of that has changed across time? Let's say I think we're already mm. there, we're already in that, but have there been some other turning points, um, big realizations? Well, sure. When I lost my voice for two and a half years, and that was a huge turning point for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when I said to myself, if I ever get it back, I'm not going to take it for granted anymore. And, you know, I pretty much kept that promise and not to criticize it in my head constantly. Mm. And so I, I've let a lot of that go. But also, I, this dream I had that, you know, I, I was in Jungian analysis for 10 years. And the, it's great for creative people because it's all about mining your dreams and, you know, um, uh, externalizing things you have in yourself and, you know, kind of making them people and talking to them <laughs> and all of this, this great creative work that led to a lot of songs for me. But Jung said that a person will have five big dreams in her life. And that dream, there was this dream about art that was my first big dream. Or maybe I had one before that, but <laughs> in childhood, but I don't know. But it was about um, seeing Art at a party, this old man named Art. <laughs> and he turned his back to me and he said, we don't respect dilettantes. And it crushed me. I woke up from the dream crying. I was crushed. And mm. also really scared that I was... I was leading myself into an ever-narrowing kind of corner with my work and that if I just kept dabbling and, you know, trying to make hit records and not really going deeper into what I did and trying to develop some mastery of it, that that it was it. I was going to end up doing parodies of myself. Mm. And it, it woke me up. And I started taking voice lessons and I started painting to see what it felt like to to have the absence of words, you know, and to learn what I did in songwriting. I did the same thing in painting. And, you know, I set up all of these kind of um, lessons for myself. (laughs) And I've never forgotten that dream or the lesson it imparted. And I'm scared to lose it. I'm scared to dream of art again and have him (laughs) turn his back to me. How old were you when that was happening? Oh, I was... 33. So you still have three big dreams left? I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then, of course, you had this brain surgery. This yeah, I had brain surgery. Was later. Yeah, I... 
that felt when when I finally got diagnosed, I'd had headaches for years. When I finally got diagnosed, it felt right when he said, you're going to have to have surgery. I, I kind of took just sighed with relief, like, oh, that's right. I kind of knew I was going to this place. And I'm so glad somebody finally knows what's wrong. And it just felt right. That doesn't mean I wasn't scared to mm-hmm. death. I was. But... I knew it was the right thing to do. And then I got really, really interested in neuroscience. And uh, did that, was that the precursor of the fractals? And- no, because I was, I've always been interested in quantum mechanics. And even when I was 24, I kind of had a newborn baby and I marched myself down to the community college to see if I could take a course in quantum <laughs> physics. <laughs> uh, and I read lay books on physics that I could understand. And, um, you know, I have a couple of friends who are physicists and they will deign to dumb down to me and try to explain things to me. Mm -hmm. There's such poetry in quantum physics, though. The language is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the concepts, you know, Schrodinger's cat. Is the cat there? Is he not there? The cat is dead and alive at the same time. There's so much creativity. Right. It's Mm -hmm. so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the fractals that that kind of perfection opened my eyes when I first realized that, that was something that existed. It was almost frightening, like, mm. I can't even grasp this. But science and quantum science particularly, that that is like a religion to me, you know? And I started to think, I really believe now that when people talk about heaven, they're talking about a parallel universe. <laughs> right. But when I had the brain surgery, um, I did get interested in neuroscience and music. And m- my friend Dan Levitin, who wrote um, your music, This Is Your, your brain, brain on Music, music. Mm-hmm. and The World in Six Songs. You know, we started doing these things at, uh, at science academies together. He would talk about science and the brain and music, and I would play a couple songs, and we'd talk about my brain surgery and... You know, I think I got I had a slightly different perception of music after the surgery. What how? Well, part of it could be just pure physiology because I had a part of the neural signal to my left ear was compressed or compromised in some way and it got better during the surgery. And the neurosurgeon told me after he was really pleased to see that signal improve. Mm-hmm. Well, unfortunately, I had the hearing of a dog in that ear for like <laughs> six months. It was excruciating, and any sound would really bother me. But um, that settled down. I'm still sensitive to some frequencies. Actually, my husband knows the exact frequency I'm I'm sensitive to. Um, but something else happened beyond that, the hearing thing. It was as if a a layer got removed and I felt myself able to improvise better and Hmm. just let myself go into things without trying to control them as much. Part, I I mean, I think part of that is chronic pain. You know, when you're in chronic pain, you do have kind of a veil over your senses. So that could be it. But there was something more subtle too. And you were, you, it was something that you were just immediately aware of. After not the immediately, surgery. not immediately, but mm-hmm. the, because I didn't play music for a while afterwards. I couldn't stand lyrics for a long time. But it, it became noticeable to me when I did start to play music. So my friend Lisa Randall, who's a theoretical a physicist, physicist right? at mm-hmm. Harvard, so I told her about this and she said, um, Has anyone taken this data down? I said, No, you know, but I I have this friend, these friends who are neuroscientists who specialize in music. She said, they're not asking you the right questions. (laughs) (laughs) She said, anecdotal evidence is really important. They need to, you know, take this down. So Dan and I have been talking about that. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, one of the things I didn't want to do when I thought about interviewing you is asking you the questions I think you get asked a lot. And I really want to talk about you and not your father or your father as, as of course, he's a huge part of you. But this, the list, you know, is, um, there's been a book written about that, Mm. the list and you and this in your life. And, um, I just wonder if you would tell a little bit of, of that story of that and 
how the importance of it evolved and what that means for you, even as a musician, as a person? Well, I went on the road with my dad directly after high school. I was 18. And I learned how to play guitar on that tour. That first summer tour I was with him when I was 18. And the Carter family and Carl Perkins were on the road with him as well. And there was time spent in the dressing rooms. And they taught me how to play guitar. And Helen Carter taught me all the Carter family songs. And I was so into it. And I was so into being with my dad with, for a long time extended period after, you know, I was a kid of divorced parents and I spent vacations and some weekends with my dad. And so here I was out with my dad. So, and immersed in his life and there were long hours on the bus and we would play songs. He would play songs to, with everyone. And he said to me one day, he said, do you know such and such a song? I said, no. And he looked a little alarmed. He said, do you know this song? I said, no. Mm -hmm. Then he got really worried, and he spent the rest of the afternoon making a list for me of what he called 100 Essential Country Songs. And he gave me the list, and he said, this is your education. And I wanted it. I think that even if he had given it to me two years earlier, I would have been like a teenager, like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, but I wanted it. I was learning to play guitar. I was wanted to be, I could sense that he was giving me a huge part of himself. And so I saved the list and I did learn the songs. I did learn the songs and I put the list away and I just, wherever I moved, I carried it in my box of letters and memorabilia and didn't think much about it. And in 2006, um, no, it was 2004, because my dad had not been dead that long. I was going through my box, and I found the list. And I said, oh, this is this cool thing Dad gave me. I forgot about this. And then when I wrote the songs for Black Cadillac, and we recorded Black Cadillac, I put that into this narrative part of the Black Cadillac show. I said, hmm. when I was 18 years old, my dad made me this list. And then I did a couple of songs from the list. Well, everybody started coming up to me saying, what about this list? <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to record the songs from All the list? All songs. Yeah. yeah. And so I said, you know, as was my natural knee-jerk reaction, I said, no, no, no. You know, I don't want to do anything to trade on my dad. I, it was like my default position my whole life, to my detriment at some point. Mm -hmm. And then after Black Cadillac, it was so intense, such an intense experience emotionally, you know, and to do those songs about mourning and death every night, it was just... I was exhausted at the end of it, and I said, I don't, I want to make a, a cover record next. Okay. And John, my husband, said, Well, if you're going to make a cover record, it's got to be the list. And it hit me, Well, of course. Right. And the other thing that hit me at the same time is that if I didn't claim my own legacy, someone else would co opt it. It would happen. Mm -hmm. Why was I pushing away this thing that was so essential to my own nature? that was important to my children, it was time to claim it. Mm -hmm. Was it fun? Was it? Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was fun. I was um, still recovering from brain surgery, so it was, um, I couldn't spend as long hours in the studio as I usually could, um, but the songs themselves were, as we said, they were healing, and it was exciting. Do you have a favorite? From the list? Yeah. Or maybe the favorite changes. It does change depending on how I feel. And, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to John because he assembled the, the record. You know, we talked about which songs were important to record, but he assembled it and arranged it. Because, like I said, I was still sick. I was mm -hmm. still recovering. And... um. Long Black Veil was really important to me 
to record that song because it's so identified with my dad, but my dad and I both identified it with Lefty Frizzell. (laughs) But when I was recording it, I kept thinking, oh my God, if dad could hear me sing Long Black Veil, he would fall over. He wouldn't (laughs) believe it. He would be so happy. (laughs) Isn't there a Mick Jagger version of that too? Oh, I'm sure there is. A lot of people have (laughs) recorded it. That's the one that I had in my head. Yeah. You would you want to? Yeah, we need to change tapes. Okay. Um. And then I want to just kind of draw to a close, but uh, maybe after we're finished, you could sing one of maybe that or something like something else from the list. something from the list hmm okay we're changing yes. tapes yeah. we're changing tapes you do you know <laughs> on my twitter page yes my profile says that I'm a Buddhist I know I know don't, don't talk about it yet oh. we're going to get there <laughs> See, this is why I don't like to be sitting together when we're not actually... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm I'm like the husband who doesn't want to see the bride before the wedding because something will happen. (laughs) So cute. You're very good at this, by the way. Like, top 1%. (laughs) Well, I thank you. You've refined although, your skills. Well, yeah, although after I wrote a book and I got interviewed myself, I realized how low that bar is. And there's, no. a, there's a lot of bad interviews out there. Right? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Hadn't noticed. I mean, you know, what I've said also is, uh, what I learned is, it's really hard to transcend a stupid question it or is. a simplistic, right? It's, if you get asked a simplistic question, it elicits a simplistic answer. If you get asked an inflammatory question, it Elicits. Right. You know, somebody told me, they said, you never have to answer the question you're asked, uh-huh. which I hate with politicians. Right. But there's a reason. Yeah. But mm-hmm. if you want to transcend it, like you said. you. But it's hard. It's tricky. Yeah. Are we... Um... Hmm? Yeah. Oh, for waiting for John. Okay. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks, Nancy. No, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> no. I put this in my writer. That's I know. I so know. So awesome. I haven't. I haven't gotten into that yet. That's good. Thanks. Okay. So let's talk about Twitter. Um, I mean, it's int- Are you? This is another thing. Are you, are you surprised? You, well, first of all, none of us would ever have imagined Twitter. No. But this has become. I, I would say, especially with you, it's there, you have a big Twitter presence. A big. It's a big part of your public persona. Yeah, I don't do Facebook. I don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, the record label does. I don't go on there. Um, Twitter seems perfect for me. It's. You know, 140 characters. As like as Mike Doty says, it's boot camp for songwriters. If you can say uh-huh. it succinctly and somewhat poetically, or with humor, and 140 characters, that's great for refining the skills as a songwriter. And also, I mean, much more than that, the cafe society that Twitter is uh-huh. is so wonderful. I have met, you know, professor of philosophy other musicians, writers, moms, doctors, tons of media people. It's really great. And um, I've learned a lot uh, and made real friends, you know. Yeah, right. And that's a little bit counterintuitive. And also what's interesting to me is people often use the words brainy and Twitter (laughs) with you in the same sentence. And I wonder, just as you say that, I wonder if it's partly because you, it's this art of songwriting that. Well, yeah. Also because I'm a 
geek and I like really geeky things. Like they posted a periodic table that was interactive. I just was on that like a game forever. Uh -huh. And, you know, the whole Jane Austen thing, I try out my Jane Austen persona on Twitter, which is really fun. And that also <laughs> helps hone language too. And mm -hmm. I, I love language. Mm -hmm. It's it's fun. And the, one of the really fun things that has happened in Twitter recently is I met this woman who is a knitting teacher, and she writes knitting books, Kay Gardner, and I asked her to give me a lesson, so I learned how to knit from Twitter. Did you do it on Twitter? Or no, you, you she's then come, had to connect Right. We first met in a coffee Twitter. shop, so I could make sure she wasn't a psycho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then she came to my house. And you do describe yourself there as a neo-folk Buddha, <laughs> Buddhist Capalian? Buddhist Capalian. Pagan, post-feminist, progressive. <laughs> Did I get it right? Yeah, that almost covers it. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I put progressive on there so that the, some of these people who follow me who expect me to be something different don't get a nasty surprise. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot. It's, some of it is just kind of tweaking people. But Buddhist Capalian is actually... Kind of close to what I feel myself to be religious in religious terms. Buddhist because um, I actually studied more about Buddhism than I did any other religion, and it makes the most sense to me. Self awareness, compassion, nonviolence. Also what the else? Impermanence that we talked. The about impermanence, earlier. right? A performance, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, compassion, nonviolence. What else do you need in a religion? I don't need to play team sports in a religion. <laughs> Um, and Episcopal because my girls went to an Episcopal school and I love the church. It's in Greenwich Village and they do a lot of outreach to gay, homeless, young people. So that's a progressive church. They're mm -hmm. very ecumenical. Um, there's somewhere that you, you use this phrase, the pantheon of my religious desires, yeah. which is also another way of evoking yeah. that list. Yeah, religious capital R, not religious as in religion so mm -hmm. much as in that great expanse of creativity and spirituality that is all the same thing to me. Mm -hmm. And I want so much to touch those things in my life and in my work, and I just keep looking for the veil to be lifted, even in a fraction of a moment, you know, I'm always looking for that. That's my religious desire. Is, um, is mystery a word you use? Carefully. I use the word mystery carefully. There are mysteries, you know, fractals are a mystery and songwriting is somewhat mysterious. There are mysterious moments. Um, and I like living with the questions mm -hmm. rather than the answers. Tom Waits said this great thing about songwriting. He he said he was driving in a car and he got an on the freeway and he got an idea for a song and it was just, you know, like overwhelming him the idea for this song and he couldn't get a pencil and there was no paper and he's on the freeway and he finally just looked up at the sky and said, "Don't you see I'm driving?" <laughs> And I feel that way sometimes, too. Don't you see I'm getting my child off to school or helping with homework or, you know, just trying to be available. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I think is really intriguing in your stories that I want to ask you about is, your, is the sense of place in your, in your life in music. Um, I mean, you were born in Memphis, but then you moved to California. Mm -hmm. But what's more... Obvious is this Nashville, New York axis. Mm -hmm. And those are really two different universes in, mm -hmm. in this culture. Well, I spent much longer in California, and I have spent much longer in New York than I ever did in Nashville. I only lived mm -hmm. in Nashville nine years. Mm -hmm. Although it's, a, but, it's kind of the homeland of a lot of the music right. that you're associated with. True, and I had a lot of hit records there. But I never felt comfortable in the... Um, in the, I felt comfortable in the community of songwriters. There were great songwriters there, 
And that was exciting, you know, to hear what somebody had written and to go to their house and hear what they were writing right then and to trade songs. That was fantastic. But the marketing and the whole industry, I felt very uncomfortable in. Mm -hmm. And then I, I also think of this in this sense of place category. You went and sang at Folsom Prison, you and John, mm. this in March 2011. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that like? That was a time travel experience, too. Some of these experiences that have a sense of mystery about them like that have something to do with time travel. It's so strange. We went there. They asked us to come to mm -hmm. speak, to, to play for and to speak with um, their music and art program. And in maximum security. And um, so we went, and I we played some songs for them. They played some songs for us. A couple people read poems. They asked questions. You know, it was a true give and take. And they had been c very carefully vetted, the, the men who came to this. And it was very moving. Mm -hmm. And one man said to me, you know, my of course, you know, my father recorded this famous record at Folsom. Right. He also recorded a very famous record at San Quentin. And one man said to me when we were there, he said, I was at San Quentin when your dad recorded the album. And now he's at Folsom. Right. <laughs> so he spent virtually his entire life in prison. And he, you know, uh, that in itself was very moving. Then the guards took us over to the old dining hall, the old prison where my dad had recorded the the album oh that was a moment out of time it I I just can't tell you the feeling of that it was it was time travel mm. I have to say I watched a little bit of it on YouTube and there's some of it on YouTube yeah <laughs> it's just a snippet but but what I noticed I mean I saw how moving it was for you which you're describing now but they also would pan to the men's faces, you know? I mean, they were just soaking this up, right? Well, I was too, you know? And one guy said to me, he said, could you ever imagine being in my place? And I said, man, some days you have more internal freedom than I do. Mm. And it's so true. So true. We create our own prisons, don't we? Mm. Wow. So, I don't know, that just happened not too long ago. Didn't yeah, in it? March. I, yeah. We went through a monsoon to get there. <laughs> it was like the first monsoon in California in, I don't know, 100 years or something. Mm -hmm. I just, I want to just end by just asking, you know, where, what you're thinking about now? Where's the, where do you see the veil lifting in I, unexpected places now? I think about my children and how... I'm the middle of this ongoing story of my family. I'm not the end of it. And I'm interested in what they're going to do. One of them is a musician. Mm -hmm. And one, you know, I still have a young child at home, my son, who's 12. And every single moment with this kid is precious to me because there's no wall between me and my own mortality anymore. You know, both my parents are gone and... I feel this urgency to complete the things I want to complete. And in the same way, I, I just feel like I'll never read all the books I want to read in this <laughs> lifetime. I'll never complete all of the projects and write all the songs I want to write. So I started taking music theory again and piano lessons. Just so maybe it'll be a doorway to go deeper into something. Um, and I feel more excited about it than I did when I was 14. Hmm. I think that, I think that's your last word. Anything else? <laughs> Do, anything else? Well, a song. Yeah, a song. <laughs> um, shall, do you want me to Whatever. play some? What do you want to? Do you want I something it, from the list or you want something else? You get to. What do you feel like? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't want to. I, I actually felt uh, when I was getting ready to talk to you, I didn't. There's so many songs, right? There's so many yeah. songs, and I, I, I was wondering what what was most meaningful f for you, and it must be interesting in your position that some of your songs are big hits, some of the songs, what is it, Seven Year Ache, that everyone mm -hmm. mentions in the first breath. Yeah. But then you must have songs that 
that are more, uh, you know, I, I think about how the I, and you've talked about this too, the, the I for a writer or a songwriter is not necessarily autobiographical, yeah. but there must be songs that are more pieces of truth about who you yeah. are, who you were then. Right. Right, and also um, my interpretation is not necessarily your interpretation mm -hmm. of my own song. Mm -hmm. um, should I move this up? Well, I'm going to do The World Unseen. Mm -hmm. This is also from Black Cadillac, and there, um, the first line, I'm the sparrow on the roof, is from the Psalms. And in the last few months of my dad's life, I read Psalms, the Psalms to him. And I don't think I ever realized how poetic the Psalms were. <laughs> and then there, this line about being a sparrow on the roof just killed me. So after my dad <laughs> died, that, that's, I wanted to start the song that way. I'm the sparrow on the roof. I'm the list of every one I have to lose. I'm the rainbow in the dirt. I am who I was and how much I can hurt. So I will look for you in stories of the kings Westward leading, still proceeding to the world unseen I'm the mirror in the hall From your empty room I can hear it fall Now that we must live apart Have a lock of hair in one half of my heart. So I will look for you between the grooves of songs we sing. Westward leading, still proceeding to the world unseen. Stream 
Westward leading, still proceeding to the world unseen. Thank, Thank you, you Roseanne Cash. Thank you. Wow. What a pleasure. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I have to give you a hug. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good well, tip. I cry. <laughs> I don't think there was much out there about that, about Did that false inquisitive one. You didn't presented. know there was much? I, did, I mean, there wasn't a lot of publicity. No, there no. wasn't a lot online. I kind of stumbled on it. There was you, a TV news coverage of it. That's well, it. We they it didn't. Local. They weren't yeah, allowed to film the men. Yeah, we yeah. didn't make a big deal. We didn't. Yeah. Put it on no, our it was like three minutes on uh, YouTube. It was just a snippet of yeah. the singing, and they showed the men. I think it was yeah, a feature from the Folsom TV. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so they they taped the whole thing actually, so it exists if yeah. you ever want it. You know, it's heavy. Yeah. It's a deeply uh, compelling philosophical, ethical, moral vortex. John had trouble with it at first, you know, because we were going in disguised really, as the doctor.